be yummy, especially on Thanksgiving week. <laughs> so as, as Celia was playing, and I hadn't actually heard that song before, it's a good one, yes? Yeah. Yes. Yes. As Celia was playing, I realized that part of moral leadership, which is what we've been talking about all month, or what I've been talking about all month, has to do with finding those things that are true beyond space and time. True principle rather than a cultural moral. Something that is beyond space and time. And the way Ernest Holmes talks about that is we need to be thankful that an all-wise father, there's the cultural moment, because it's an all-wise being or mother or whatever fits for you, <coughs> We need to be thankful that an all-wise father has planted within us a guide to the right conduct, which we call conscience. But we also need to be careful that we do not allow it to destroy our happiness because of something which, when seen with correct judgment, has no moral wrongness to it. So, for me, Celia's music represents the best of paganism. It represents the best of Wicca, of the old mother goddess understanding. And there was a time which in paganism is called the burning times, back when women who spoke up and had actual opinions, boy would I be in trouble, <laughs> were burned at the stake. Where women who were healing far more, far more better, far more successfully than the male doctors who were using, uh, leeches actually work sometimes, but things like bloodletting, uh, things like, um, well, basically bleeding people dry is what they did. And if you survived that, you were probably going to survive whatever got you there. <laughs> the women were having more success in their healing and the men, the doctors, the people who went to college, didn't much like it. And so that was part of why women were called witches and told that they were using the power of Satan that pagans don't believe in. You know Satan's not a pagan thing, right? Okay, just making sure. And so sometimes Going back to these ideas of what's right and what's wrong, it kind of depends on what culture you're in and where it is in its own evolution, where you are in history. Who here knows who George Fox is? Okay, so if you are, yeah, well, you cheat. <laughs> George Fox was born in 1624. And he grew up very happily in a basically Puritan household. Uh, his writings indicate that he had a good childhood, that he loved his parents, that he felt loved by them. And he had a deep connection with his religion. And as he got older, later on, he started looking at his religion and saying, you know, my religion is one of love. My God is one who is the perfect love that completes us, that is filling all of, all of us up and giving us life. But what he was hearing about from the priests of his day was sinfulness, and how messed up we are, and how not enough we are, and how going to hell we all are. Man, hell's going to have a heck of a good party, yeah? <laughs> all the best people are going to be there. All the fun ones anyway, right? <laughs> And so he had to start backing away from his faith. That thing that defined him, that in his day and age, actually people were warring over. He ended up at one point in his life meeting Oliver Cromwell and having a lovely conversation with him, which unfortunately later on bit him in very tender areas. <laughs> Oliver Cromwell, for those of you who aren't history geeks, is one of the people who had a really good time waging religious wars within England. So that the, the Catholics and the Protestants, or if you are on the other side, the real believers and the Papists, 
um, they were killing each other for years. So again, moral leadership kind of depends on, at that point, what family you were born into. Those horrible people were teaching the one God the wrong way. In that interest. And before we start getting cocky about that, I am reminded that we as an organization split up in the 50s and didn't come back together until, until 2012. Using the same book and the same curriculum to teach the oneness of the divine, but they were doing it wrong. We are very interesting mammals, are we not? All of this morality that we get into, and I have seen it really hurt families when the moral answer to something says X, but and somebody else is being pulled by spirit into Y. Actually, that's very apt, come to think of it. It's that Y that gets us in trouble every single time. Well, why would unbaptized babies go to hell? Why, 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 why? It was all of those things that got us thrown out of uh, religion class or Sunday school. Those whys. Those are the temporal morals. And what we do, what we strive to do by questioning our own thinking, is get back to principle, get back to that unending, perfect oneness. Get back to those things we call God qualities, like love and power and peace. Not control, but power. Power to rather than control over. And so that's the moral side that I've been talking about. Now, our friend George ended up, and this is part of why Celia reminded me of, of him, um, one of the first times he is recorded as having gotten into big trouble, as opposed to all the little troubles, he was at a Bible study, and a woman wanted to ask a question, and was told to sit down because women were not allowed to speak in that minister's church. <laughs> Good old George, uh, one of the original feminist allies, um, which, by the way, Jesus was too. He stood up and questioned why she couldn't ask questions. He kept doing stuff like that till he started getting arrested a lot. Some of the most moral people have very long arrest records. Look at Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Look at Gandhi. Heck, look at Jesus, who we call the master teacher, the great example. Now, I am not telling you that he's a great example of how to deal with the political powers and that you should all go out and get crucified. <coughs> but should you get arrested for your principles, the only thing I'm going to say to you is shut up till your lawyer gets there. <laughs> it's the only legal advice I give. Shush. And so these wonderfully principled, moral people often get in trouble with those who are trying to preserve the status quo. Now, George Fox went on to um, give us the original version of Friends. Um, he thought it was big in the 80s when Jennifer Aniston was on it. When George Fox did it, he ended up with a society of friends who we call the Quakers. His brother was William Penn. And he eventually traveled up and down the east coast of what is now America, and often he stayed with the Native Americans. He was of the opinion that these people, who others might have called savages at the time, these people had something worthy within them. These people were also children of the light, children of the one, one God, because that one God goes by many names. And so, these were the people, these friends, often were the people who were getting in trouble and still getting in trouble in the best possible way. These were the leaders of the abolitionist movement here in America. And it started with this one man 
who listened to the voice within him that said, people are not as bad as the current religion keeps telling me. There's no such thing as a God who wants us all in hell. There's no such thing as someone who is left out of the Christ mind. This is also what Jesus said. This is also what Buddha said. This is what all the great teachers have said, that we are one, and that any behavior that brings us more life and more awareness of that one is moral and good. So that, in my mind, is less about the little petty picking at things about which knee do I genuflect on and whether I'm allowed to speak in church. I'm required to speak in church now. These things change. Yes? Yes. Heck, y'all pay me to speak in church. So that's what the moral part is. And in my meditation, what I came to is what we're really changing is the definition of leadership. See, I was trained to be a supervisor by the county of San Diego. I took the classes. I think I still have the certificate so I can prove that I can watch other people work <laughs> successfully and get them to do certain things. Management and supervision and ruling over have to do with getting people to behave in a certain way. I don't care what you think. And if I wanted to know what you think, I would tell you what that was. <laughs> How well do you think I would do here if that was my real attitude? Would I have lasted more than, oh, five, ten minutes? I would really need remedial humanity 101. And yet that is the old flavor of leadership, what we used to call leadership. Now, I've actually been studying leadership longer than I've been studying science of mind. Leadership principles. How do we motivate people to do their best instead of ordering them and then ignoring them? Once upon a time, once you have received those orders, you know, it was either do it or you'll lose your job. Do it or we'll beat you. Do it or, you know, the devil's going to get you. And so now we are trying to raise up our own thinking into what does leadership look like? What does it require from all of us? What it requires is a greater ownership and understanding of what oneness really is. Now we're of the belief that thoughts are things and that we can create our own reality, yes? So when we begin seeing things like the internet, what I see is an outpicturing of a greater understanding of the one mind. The internet is the one mind in its earlier form in terms of what is physical in our world today. I think it'll get better. I think it'll, it's a reflection of this divine idea that has been taught for thousands of years. But the internet is now where we go to connect, and yes, we are fumbling all over the place with how we're doing on that, yes? Yeah. I mean, divine cat videos and dating. Swipe left, swipe right. We are still bringing some of our old ideas with us. But the new idea of leadership, the new idea of how we're going to be in the world requires us to participate, all of us, to own the power, to own the wisdom to own the, the sense of this doesn't feel right to me and so I need to sit with it, I need to chew on it, and I need to figure out what the right answer is for me. Now if I had said that to the nuns when I was a kid, how well, yes, ten Hail Marys and a couple of concentrations later, I might be allowed to speak again. I actually had really nice nuns, so I'm just going to go with the stereotype here. <sighs> Leadership is the art and science of inspiring people to find the truth and the power within themselves. Now, it takes longer than just telling somebody what to do. 
being a good leader is a lot more work than being a good supervisor. I know I've done both. Ernest Holmes said, right action will be compelled through right knowing. Therefore, when we know the truth, it will compel us to act in a correct manner. Now, who here has dealt with either toddlers or teenagers? <laughs> who here has found it challenging to trust that that right thought, that we spend so much time getting into them or pulling out of them or nailing to their forehead for the love of all that is holy, Trusting that that right thinking will cause right action when we can't watch them. Does anybody else remember that feeling of, it's been too quiet for too long, what the kids doing? <laughs> and what will I have to repaint? <laughs> True leadership trusts the universe. Holmes also wrote, when we learn to trust the universe, we shall be happy, prosperous, and well. When we learn to trust the universe that lives in our neighbors, as well as in ourselves, we will begin being safe to have dialogue. Sometimes I'll ask people for an opinion, and these days, especially if I'm asking for, you know, what's your opinion, have you been paying attention to what's going on in the world today? I get the answer, you know, I really don't think we should talk about that. You don't want my opinion. With the assumption, I guess, that I will disagree and that will cause us to, I don't know, kill each other or something. We don't need to do that anymore. If the Spirit of God is speaking through somebody else's opinion and I can trust that, then really what it comes down to is this is my understanding of right thought and this is your understanding of right thought and let's get together and learn. Let's get together and have these conversations and that requires leadership that will teach us how to do it and then leadership that will model doing it, not just teach it in the classroom. These things need to happen in conversation. And sometimes people are going to have disagreements. And you know what happens? Maybe you learn something, maybe they learn something, but you're still allowed to have coffee here. We will not take the cookies away if you are so foolish as to disagree with me. I might eat them faster. And so there's stuff that we do together, including classes, including coming together on a Sunday and talking about whatever it was that happened during service, excuse me. These are the tools that we use. And because leadership is no longer, like it doesn't end at the lip of the platform, or what I was raised calling the altar, it doesn't end there. And it doesn't even end at our walls. We can go out into the world and allow spirit to teach us through every single person we meet. It does take longer. But it's also more powerful and longer lasting. Now there's a, a space where Holmes talks about the difference, in, in my opinion, he talks about the difference between a ruler and a leader. And this is what it is. How many of you can quote Genghis Khan? Or Attila the Hun? What about Napoleon Bonaparte? <laughs> the only Napoleon Bonaparte quotation I know, as far as I can think of right now, is never interrupt your enemy while he's making a mistake. <laughs> and that's very much about ruling and how to be in power and control over. How many here can quote the Buddha on anything? Know a little bit about what he talked about? What about Jesus? How many here know more about the lives of Jesus or Buddha than they do about Attila the Hun? And how many of us teach our children about the teachings of Jesus as opposed to the teachings of Genghis Khan. Mm -hmm. 